Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, part two, the running back player by player profiles for the 2020 fantasy football season. Joining me on the line is going to be from theathletic.com, Chris Meany, at Chris Meany on the Twitter box. Joe Pizapia, the author of the Fantasy Football Black Book. We've already done part one. You want to check that out? Go to the description of this podcast or video, and you can find that right now. You want to jump to a player in particular? You can hit the time codes for the show. You can do that with all the shows on the Pat Mayo Experience, just like smashing the like button, leaving the DraftKings handle in the comment section, and telling me how many running backs you would draft by name before you drafted a wide receiver at the very top of drafts this year. You get that, 20 DK bucks, you're in that draw. You want to get into a drop for 100 DraftKings dollars? Subscribe to the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast, leave a five-star review, DraftKings handle, and something you enjoy about the Pat Mayo Experience, boom, you're going to be in that draw. Let's get to the show. Going down the list, we had Chubb, Mixon, Jacobs, Fournette as a part of this tier two after the big four running backs. And they're all clustered together in terms of ADP. And that's the order that they're currently coming off the board. Not my rankings, the order that they're coming off the board. So if you want to check out the full deep dive on those guys, check out part one of the show. But Joe, that leads us into Aaron Jones, running back number eight, 14 overall, going after these guys that... You've talked about a lot in part one about Aaron Jones, the second best PPR running back last year, third in points per game uh, in PPR scoring. Not a guy who catches a ton of balls either, but he scored a shit ton of touchdowns. But you see what the Packers do in the draft. Uh, Everyone was very critical of what they've done in the draft, but we've seen Matt LaFleur in his time in Tennessee. He had Derrick Henry all these years. What'd he do? He split him up with Deion Lewis almost the entire time. Matt LaFleur leaves town. All of a sudden, it's Derrick Henry's show. You get Matt LaFleur going to Green Bay. It's not like Aaron Jones had a command over this backfield. Every second week, Jamal Williams was playing. And then they go out and spend second-round draft capital on A.J. Dillon. I don't know what is going on. I can see Aaron Jones being the number three running back in fantasy this year, but probably not a guy that I'm going to be drafting on any of my teams and probably not certainly inside the top 10 or running back. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to look at how good he was last year or how productive at the very least he was last year and what your expectations are. And this is where projectability really matters because like you said, is Dylan going to get into it more? Aaron Jones certainly was fighting for that role, but I'm not sure what more this guy has to do to stake his claim to it. 19 touchdowns, 474 receiving yards. I mean, the guy was just productive. So maybe it's best that Dylan's there because maybe this continues to light that fire under Aaron Jones where nobody believes in him. And every year he just keeps showing up, you know, and I think that there's something to that. And I think that's actually a positive that will continue to motivate him and maybe it wasn't LaFleur. I mean, in terms of what they want to do offensively, maybe it was coming down from the general manager where they said, hey, we signed Deion Lewis and we want him to be a part of the thing. And they try and try to make it work and they just didn't work. I'll say this. If I'm going to end up with, say, Josh Jacobs on one end or Leonard Fournette at a turn, I am perfectly happy to get Aaron Jones on the other end of that. Because if my question mark with Jacobs or Fournette is touchdowns, that's the one department where I still feel pretty damn confident. When they get down lower there, we know Aaron jo- uh, Aaron Rodgers is not uh, one to always look for the tight end in the red zone. That's not always going to be their game, Green Bay. So it's going to be the running back, and I think that's very important to understand. And, and yeah, there's going to be guys in times where he does not get the ball down there, and it's going to be frustrating. But even if he regresses all the way to 13 touchdowns, that's a really good – second back to build a two-headed monster with with him and Jacobs or him and Fournette I think that's a really nice way to go meaning one of my least favorite arguments that people can make when discussing fantasy because they want to have the 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 entire cake because no one ever wants to be wrong when they state opinions uh I'm consistently wrong so I'm very okay with that but other people they want to hedge a bit this way and hedge a bit this way it's the best ball argument well I wouldn't draft him but I'd take him in best ball it's like great you'd take anyone in best ball that's fantastic but (laughs) honest to god like with Aaron Jones I'm good with not drafting him in any season long league and be a guy I fire up on DraftKings. Like he does cluster scoring. I yes. don't, out of all of these top end running backs, he's the guy who can go out and put you up three points. He's also the guy who can put up 40 points that 
for a season long fantasy format, I don't want to spend a first round pick or second round pick on a guy who leaves me high and dry 30% of the time. Now, 70% of the time, he could be a weak winner. And maybe you can construct a team where that's okay. But I like to have those guys, the sort of the. I mean, Aaron Jones is better than like vintage Deshaun Jackson was for fantasy scoring because he's a running back, but the old school Santana Moss, Deshaun Jackson, where if they have a good week, you probably win that week, but there's going to be weeks where they leave you high and dry. And this is a second round pick, not an eighth round pick. Yeah, you're you're dead on. Put him in the Millie Maker and and watch the points pile up, or or maybe you rip or, him or, up. Or, like, or lose like your twenty bucks. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, and and Joe is talking about earning the respect, and I agree. He he probably has deserved that respect, but again, it's Matt Lafleur, which Pat you brought up, and and the multiple backs that he likes to use, and they draft one, and Jamal Williams was was even when Jones was having good games, Williams was getting red zone touches, and it was and made you scratch your head a little bit, like why? I mean, he just marched all the way up the field with Jones, and you put in Williams, and you still in the red zone, didn't make a whole lot of sense. But yeah, I mean, you look at the game log: eight for 30, 13 for thirty eight, eleven for eighteen, sixteen for one thirty four. <laughs> 23 for 154 has a game where he has four touchdowns that came against the Cowboys and, and a game where he had seven catches. So I, I think that where he's going and where we're talking about him going is an immediate pass. But I think there's a lot of people that are sour on Jones. And when we did the athletic mock last week, he went the end of the third and I'm perfectly fine with that price at the end of the third. I look at the catches 49 grabs. I think that's a number that he can get to again, because we just talked off the top here with the Packers. They did absolutely nothing to help out Aaron Rodgers. Who's the number two in this offense? Lazard. Great. Like who's going to be the number two in this offense It's probably going to be Aaron Jones. He's probably going to be the guy who finishes second in the team in targets with, and, and catches potentially with everything going to Adams. Then after that, a lot of question marks. So, I think to Jones, when I go into drafts, complete fade. But if he's going to be a guy that a lot of people are just sour on and say, okay, 16 touchdowns on the ground, he's not going to do that again. He could probably easily get to 10. And if he's going to fall to the end of the third, because nobody wants a piece of him, then I'm going to jump in. Yeah. If he starts sliding down draft boards, I absolutely get the case where he's currently going running back number nine, number 14 overall probably a bit too high for my liking so the next running back joe the time is finally yours running back 10 in Ugh. ppr leagues per adp number 16 overall your guy derrick henry who last season in ppr points per game finished 0.1 behind aaron jones so it was mccaffrey dalvin cook aaron jones derrick henry those were your top four ppr points per game at running back last year and who's the guy in all these running backs we talked about who's most likely to get the same if not similar workload, right? We talk about all the variants, the variants of holdouts, the variants of challenging uh, for the running back position in Green Bay. Uh, we talked about uh, Alvin Kamara and the question surrounding what is Alvin Kamara really when he's all by himself? All these questions, right? I got nothing but answers when it comes to Derrick Henry. I know who he is. I know when he plays. And I know when he's going to play, he's going to touch the football a ton. Is Tennessee the greatest offense that ever played the NFL football? No, of course not. But are they an offense that's predictable? Yes, and that's good. I like that. I like the predictable floor, and I like to have a running back on my team that I know every week is going to give me upside for a touchdown, which Derrick Henry is going to give you, and he's also going to give you uh, somewhere around 20 carries a game. And again, those guys do not grow on trees anymore. It is not what she used to be. Uh, all these running backs by committee and all these different specialty backs and specialty backs for certain downs and, and this scheme and this formation, and all this stuff. Uh-uh. Derrick Henry, it's like 1987, man. They just turn around, hand the football, and they go win. And that's what I'm all about. So give me Derrick Henry. I think it's a travesty, travesty that he's this low in some rankings. So if you just project in, hey, maybe Derrick Henry doesn't score close to 20 touchdowns this year. Let's say he falls back in that. Let's say he's not he's not the rushing leader on the ground and the catches mm-hmm. stay exactly the same. Let's say he scores 80% of what he did last year. He would be scoring 15.6 fantasy points per game in PPR leagues, meaning at the running back position. That would put him the same as Nick Chubb. <laughs> i love math meanie <laughs> yeah same um yeah i mean i look at i look at two years ago derrick henry and and how bad he was remember how disappointing he was and everyone dropped him and he was available and even still like oh do we even bother to pick him up all right we'll pick him up do we can we even trust him and then he came on strong towards the end and he finishes as a top 15 uh running back in, in a full point ppr setting and a guy that had 215 carries 
and a thousand yards. And then you see the offense just really open up with Tannehill. Pat, how many times have you and I had the conversation watching the Titans games over the years and being like with Marcus Mariota, they just knew boxes were stacked. There was no hope for Derrick Henry when they turned off and handed him the ball. That's why they had to put Deion Lewis on there and try to play catch up from, from time to time. But with Brian Tannehill and open up the play action, it just really opened things up for Derrick Henry. So I think the only question mark that I have with Henry is in dynasty leagues. Like how many more years, like he goes from two fifteen carries to three Oh three. And then all that work that he had in the playoffs that Joe alluded to earlier, I mean, against the new England Patriots in Baltimore, he had almost 400 yards on 64 carries where Tannehill didn't even throw the football and everybody knew that he was going to run who is it earl thomas was it earl thomas that was trashing him like oh new england can't tackle him i'll show you how to tackle him. There uh-huh. was nothing he yeah could then do there was that. that famous clip of earl thomas like running behind him trying to chase him. trying to chase him <laughs> so i think he has another solid year of giving this guy the ball at least 280 times and and finishing as a, a rb1 a lock I, again dynasty Sure, maybe you want to fade him. Maybe you want to flip him now. Is the time to get rid of him, sell high on him? Because I don't know if he can have another season with 300 after this one coming. But I have no problem with Henry. People are sour on him because of the catches, because of the Titans, uh, because maybe they drafted him years past and he wasn't good. So if you're gonna, if he's going to fall to the end of the first, I think it's an absolute steal. Yeah, for me, I whiffed hard on Derrick Henry last season. I just didn't think that he would continue the pace of the final four games of the previous season. Be like, you are buying fool's gold, is essentially what I said. This guy doesn't catch the ball. If he doesn't score 20 touchdowns, you're kind of fucked. And then he scored 18. It turns out you weren't fucked whatsoever, despite the fact (laughs) that he couldn't even crack 20 receptions for the season. Joe, do you think there's any chance that he improves in the receiving game, or is that just never going to be a part of his game? I don't think it's going to be part of his game, but I mean, it doesn't have to be part of his game, right? I mean, it's it's very funny because just because it's a PPR format and no, everybody knows, and you even said at the top, nobody's more format oriented than I am. But at the end of the day, points are points, yards are yards, touchdowns are touchdowns. And if you can bank on a guy in this era in the NFL where there are so many situations that are unclear, I don't understand why clarity isn't more valuable because clarity should be valuable. Uh, Having a clear path to fantasy points and playing time is exactly what everybody's trying to carve out. And they try to make all these other excuses for Nick Chubb that everything's going to go his way or, you know, this player, that player. But why do you have to make excuses when there's already an excuse free guy who is there for the taking? And that's, I guess, my point of view on Henry. Um, I think it's possible. Go Just ahead. to jump in here, I think it's slightly possible. I, I agree with Joe that it, it he doesn't need to have those catches, but I think it's slightly possible that he continues to be a little bit more of a player in the passing game where maybe he catches 24 to 25 balls. And I know it doesn't seem like much, but every year his targets have gone up and they, they haven't gone up a whole lot, but 15 to 17 to 18 to 24. It is possible that he does fall into a role where he catches another seven or eight balls, another half a catch a game i know it doesn't seem like a whole lot but when you're as explosive as him and he rattles off a 75 yard reception to the house i mean that's pretty valuable on itself yeah see that's the whole thing that's why i'm not looking for derrick henry to have 50 targets this year which would be you know more than double his 24 from a year ago that if he could get up to 35 something like that maybe run a few because we did the 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 thing that you're talking about is that design play week one when he had the screen pass that he took 75 yards to the house that just get him the ball more in space maybe in space and just let him go that it's not just the one point that i'm concerned about when it comes to ppr scoring and that's why i think that guys that specialize in catching passes in standard leagues also a lot of the times get undervalued because you're thinking about the floor you're thinking about the base of the one point that comes along with the reception but you're not including that's more opportunities to score touchdowns that's more opportunities to pile up yardage and if you're actually running designed routes, not just dump offs that will get you into space and maybe you can get some chunk yardage. That was actually a bonus for Aaron Jones last year. They actually utilized him really yeah. well in the passing game. The times that they decided to use him in the passing game. Sometimes he was a non-factor. They just decided not to use him because apparently that's what the Packers do. But the <laughs> games where they wanted him to run routes, he ran fine routes. He had, he had 142 receiving yards in one game. Like, yeah. And those were legit routes downfield that right. I'm, I'm not saying, hey, we're going to be running all wheel. It's Derrick Henry's not going to have James White's route tree. He's not Darren Sproles. But give him <laughs> two shots a game at this. Just One as, of his legs is Darren Sproles, yeah, Pat. One of, one of Derrick Henry's legs is Darren Sproles. I can tell you that right now. And you know what? Don't be afraid if they ease up on him again in September because that seems to be the trend, too, is they kind of go easy in September with Derrick Henry. Don't freak out because once we heard in October, it becomes Derrick Henry season. 
once the leaves change, that's when we start to see him start to roll. And that's when defenses start to get a little more tired. And then the next thing you know, this guy's completely fresh. Yeah. And he's a safe play, despite the fact that he doesn't have that reception floor, just because the Mm -hmm. amount of carries that he gets just yardage in itself is probably going to get you to double digits. And one of the big bonuses with Aaron Jones was the double digit touchdown games. I think he had six of them a year ago that Henry is just live to score three touchdowns in any game. I don't think he, he only scored three touchdowns in what was it, the playoff? No, the final week of the season against the Texans. He scored the three touchdowns, had the 211 yards receiver rushing. But other than that, it was like two, one, 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 two, 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 one, one every single week. Like, at some point, like Joe said, you can just pencil him in to do these things, and I'll, I'll take my L on Derrick Henry. I'm with you, Mean. I don't know what he's going to be like mm. next, next year, but this year, I have a feeling that unless he gets hurt, he's going to do this again. Exactly. Yeah. Joe says, and when he's talking about questions, there's, there's just none with, with Henry. <laughs> he's the offense. It's going to run through him. They, who they draft Darrington Evans, like a rookie back. He's not cutting into anything that Henry's going to do, especially inside the red zone. Next on the list, running back number 11 in terms of average draft position this season. And this is the one that shocks me, Meany. Delvin Cook. Yeah, this one doesn't add up. Uh, I'm sure when we get closer to the season, he's going to continue to jump up uh, draft boards. I mean, I could see it last year having some pause, and I'll admit I did. I was a little hesitant to, to pull the trigger on Dalvin Cook, knowing that he only played four games as a rookie in 11 in year two. I was a little concerned. I saw the upside. I could see it when he was on the field. He was healthy. He was he was phenomenal, and we saw it last year. And even still, towards the end of last year, maybe he let a couple people down. I don't feel bad for those people. Derek, Dalvin Cook got you in a spot to to win a fantasy football championship last year. You just disappointed in the last couple of games. But 4.6 yards per carry for his career, uh, 96, 93 grabs in his last two years, and, and just really being a big part of what they do inside the red zone, too. And they want to run the football there. Even with Stefanski gone, it's still going to be the game plan. They're going to want to run the football. No digs. They draft Jefferson, but they're still going to want to run the football with Dalvin Cook. So, yeah, this one doesn't add up because there's only a handful of backs, actually four, that had 500 rushing yards, 500 receiving yards, 50 catches, and 4.5 yards per carry. And he's an elite company with CMC, Alvin Kamara, and another guy we'll save for later. But Cook is... Cook's in there for me. He's he's locked and loaded. He's one of the safest backs in football, I think. So is this – now, I, I'm trying to figure this out, Joe. Now, I know that when Cook ended up going out and they used the Boone King, that didn't really work out the first time around. <laughs> they used him again. It wasn't so bad. But, you know, they were already out by that point. Yeah, he's screwed. Derrick Henry also missed a game in the fantasy playoffs. I think people forget about that. That He That's sucks. Right. Don't ever use him again. Like, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> Guys get hurt. With Cook, mm-hmm. is it the injuries that are scaring people, or is it the potential that he might hold out this season? Because it doesn't seem to bother people with Joe Mixon, but it does for Delvin Cook, the guy who was second in points per game at running back last year. Uh, it's both of them, and I think that's where you get this ranking from. I disagree wholeheartedly with this ranking. I think whoever did it was absolutely just hammered drunk when they did this. <laughs> but yeah, there's those risks. But it's funny, you know, Alvin Kamara is a risk too. But I've seen a a healthy Dalvin Cook be an absolute superstar stud when he was given the backfield by himself. I have not seen that yet from Alvin Kamara. But then there's Alvin Kamara, who's ranked all the way up at number three in this list, and Dalvin Cook, who's somewhere just, I don't know, farting around the second round somewhere. And I don't understand the, the mindset here. Yes, the injuries are a concern. Yes, Madison being there is a concern because they have somebody who's pretty good there to back up. Yeah, it's the last year of the deal. Yeah, the holdout. All those things make for risk. But the lower he drops, the more I know I would be apt to take that risk. If you tell me, do I want to take him with a top five overall pick? I probably don't. But if you're telling me you're going to give him to me, just hand him to me on a silver platter in the second round of a draft, I'm going to take that risk every single day because I'm going to make sure there's very few situations where handcuffs are worth doing. This is a situation where handcuff is worth doing because I know the back behind him is capable and he's not going to be Dalvin Cook, but he's going to be productive. You can't say that about whoever's backing up Ezekiel Elliott or whoever backing up Saquon Barkley. Those, I mean, how bad were the giant running backs after Saquon Barkley got hurt? I mean, it Uh, was bad. Wayne Gallman won me some bucks on DraftKings. Uh, (laughs) Wayne Gallman's one game won you bucks on DraftKings because he was negative price. And good for you that you were able to get him on there. But the point being is, Dalvin Cook is very, very usable as a second round pick. It's great. I don't think you're going to get him in the second round. I think he's going to be gone in the first round, late first round. I really do. 
And look, we'll see as we get clarity, as we go through the summertime here, what the holdout looks like. Uh, but look, there's no denying Dalvin Cook has had multiple years of injury history, more even than Leonard Fournette. And there's enough reason to be skeptical of him. But we also know the upside. And as your second running back or second round pick, I don't know if there's a guy you could find who has the upside of Dalvin Cook. Yeah, I, I guess it's the troika of problems here. Potential holdout, <laughs> injury history. Madison is so good that, hey, yes. maybe they continue to give the ball to Madison over and over. But they basically did that last year, and it didn't matter. That even if he gets his 9, 10 carries a game, who cares? This is just how the Vikings are going to run. And it's not like they have digs around anymore. Like, exactly. I know Jefferson comes into the building, but I don't think he's going to command the target no. share that a Stephen Diggs did. So you might even see more carries and more touches and more market share of the receiving work go to the backfield. When I talked about this with Sealy Meany about two months ago, before the draft, before potential holdouts or anything like that, I made the case that you could draft Elvin Cook over Saquon Barkley if you wanted to. I don't know if I would. I think Barkley's better, but I think he's firmly in that mix. Yeah, when we were talking about tiers like CMC, Barkley, and Zeke, Cook is, is he's so close to being in that tier for me. He's my fourth back. Uh, I would rather him than Alvin Kamara. And I mean, you bring up a good point with Madison is that he just I'm looking at his game log. There was a couple games, 12 carries, 14, 13, 14. One game against Detroit where Madison had 14 carries and, and Dalvin Cook still at 18. <laughs> Another game where... Was that against the Eagles, Meany? No, but that one is on there as well. 14 carries that against was, the I remember Eagles. that big split game and they were both pretty good in that one. They were both good. They Yeah, they both uh, you know got there. So even if Madison comes in and has four or five games of double-digit carries, it doesn't mean that Cook is not... Here's another one against Washington. 13 for 61 Madison. And what a Dalvin Cook doing that game, 23 carries, 100 yards, and caught five balls out of the backfield. So both of these guys, you know, can be productive. I'm not saying that, you know, draft Madison. I'm not into really handcuffs, but Joe also brings up a good point. It's like we're not talking about Chubb and Kareem Hunt where Hunt's going to cost you something. Madison's not going to cost you anything. He can come in and be productive. Anything does happen to Cook, pr protect your investment. But for me, Cook is – he's really close, Pat, to, to being in that Zeke Barkley tier. I wouldn't hate anybody for really debating it, and I think – you know, where Joe says he's probably not going to be in the second round. I don't think he is certainly not in any drafts for me. If he falls outside the top five backs and Adams is off the board and Thomas is off the board, I'm going to be sitting there and debating between cook and Julio as a guy that I want. And I want three down backs. So that is the end of that extended second tier. So McCaffrey, Barkley, Kamara, Elliott. And, and this is all in terms of average draft position as we have it right now, the drafts that have been done so far, this is how people are going. No one's rankings. It's just how they're being drafted, people. Just don't yell at me for it. We're just saying this is kind of stupid. Then the second tier after that, Chubb, Mixon, Jacobs, Fournette, Jones, Henry, Cook. That's picks 10 to 17. Chris Godwin's actually in that mix, too. But, again, he's not a running back. He's a wide receiver. So we'll get to him on a different show. That if you played in a 12-team league, what this is telling me is that the turn picks would be Jacobs and Fournette when you could have Henry and Cook instead. <laughs> yeah steals yeah i mean yeah you're gonna I, win every league if that happens i'm just telling you right now it just lock up a championship if that if you can even pull that off i'd be shocked the weird thing is like it, it's plausible but it i is. i just don't see that by the time actual drafting comes around for the majority of people that either of those two guys are that low Right. I, I could see I could see Mixon and Jacobs and both of those guys are I think are trending up in the in the fantasy industry. I could see people taking shots on those guys over Henry and and Cook, but I I, I think it's wrong. All right. Well, let's get to the next tier. Now we have like a scatter shot of players. So Cooks was running back number eleven. He was a part of that large second tier that included seven running backs. Running back number twelve off draft boards this season right now. Now of the Denver Broncos, where they still have Royce Freeman, where they still have Philip Lindsay currently on the roster. Devontae Booker did go to, uh, I was going to say Oakland, but Vegas. LV, hanging out with my main man Coolio in Gangster's Paradise, LV. But that's <laughs> something I'm going to fuck up the entire year. Melvin Gordon, <laughs> Joe, is the next running back. This makes no sense to me. No, uh, there's, there's a bunch of guys there I think we should get to before Melvin Gordon. But I think it's a good landing spot for Melvin Gordon. I've been saying... You know the phrase, too big to fail? I feel like that's what they've done here for Drew Locke. They've given him Cortland Sutton. They've given him Sherry Judy. He's got Noah Fant, who had a nice finish last year. And look, Drew Locke wasn't as bad as everyone thought he was going to be at the end of last year. And now you're going to give him Melvin Gordon, and Lindsey's still there. He's got so many weapons. He just If he fails, it's completely on him. And I think it might actually be impossible for him to fail. And he's going to be a really nice third quarterback in Superflex leagues. 
And part of that's going to be he can rely on Melvin Gordon. However, I'm just not sold on Melvin Gordon quite here. Melvin Gordon, it, you know, you can't take too much out of last year because when a guy comes in late and doesn't have training camp and all that stuff, it's just it throws everything off. Yeah, but, so you but, can't but, really but, gauge. but, but hold on. Here's what you mm-hmm. can gauge. That's not going to happen in Denver. Despite oh, the fact, I know exactly what you're saying. Despite <laughs> the fact that he missed 10 weeks of the season, he was still seventh in the league in carries from inside the five yard line. Right. And he's averaging seven targets a game over the second half of the season, which is just not going to happen in Denver. No, it's not. And I think that's a big problem with these rankings. And I, the other thing I thought you were going to point out is we've had Melvin Gordon multiple years not be able to finish a season, which is another thing that people, let's not forget. I, I feel like everyone has amnesia sometimes when they talk about these players. They only see the projectability instead of the reality. And it's very important to go back and see the reality. How old is this running back? How much treads on the tires? How many times did he go through 16 games? Melvin Gordon, historically, I know a couple of years ago, he's having a great season. Then he got hurt. He was not there for the playoffs. And I know it sunk a lot of my team. So I think Melvin Gordon as an RB2, a low-end RB2, is a good value. But I think there's some guys that I would gladly take over him. So, Meany, Melvin, like I said, the 13th running back coming off the boards for PPR scoring. And we're going to get this to when we get to Austin Eckler, too. Like, Philip Rivers likes throwing to his running backs. That's just a fact. And that's going to translate into a lot of safe fantasy points over and over. Melvin Gordon's going to lose that going to Denver. He has to compete with two other running backs for touches. Yeah, he's probably going to be the lead. But what's the lead in this situation? Is it 75% of the touches? I don't think so. It's probably going to be like 50 yeah, I, I agree because Philip Lindsay is still there. And this is somebody who had a thousand yards last year and a thousand yards the year before that and has had 35 catches in each of those two seasons as well. So he's still going to be a player in the offense. If I'm looking at which guy's going to be the goal line back, I say that it's going to be Gordon, but it would it shock me if it was Philip Lindsay coming in there and stealing touches? No, this is just going to be a sticky situation. He's going to both of these guys are actually going to be complete passes for me because of that. I think this is a win for Denver, and Joe talks about it. They're one of the big winners in the draft. Drew Locke has, has got himself a ton of weapons. Uh, Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler. I mean, they drafted. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his, his name. I'll call him Big. Big A, Albert O, uh, the tight end. Uh, and plus they have no offense. So there's a lot of weapons there. I think that Denver wants to run the football. I think both of these guys will combine for probably 25 carries a game if all if things go right. But it's just going to be, is it going to be a hot hand type deal? And, and Melvin Gordon, you look at his career, there's one outlier. I mean, there's one season where he played 16 games and there's one season where he had over 3.9 yards per carry. Other than that, it's been pretty disappointing, really. I mean, he finds the end zone with the Chargers over the past few years as being the goal line back there and Eckler not being that guy to take those touches away from him inside the 10. But Lindsey could. Royce Freeman could. Royce Freeman had more catches than Lindsey last year. That shocks a lot of people. It shocked me. I had to look at that twice to, to double take to see if that was actually the case. So there's a lot going on in Denver. There's a lot of weapons. So I, I think that I'm just going to have to pass on Melvin Gordon. I'm sure he's going to have a lot to prove to himself and to others, but it, not for me. One year, he's had a solid 1,000 yard campaign. He's Now he's got to work with Philip Lindsay in the backfield. It's just a pass for me. Yeah. Running back 13, 22 overall in PPR leagues. It's just too high. So the next player yeah. up number 28 overall running back number 14, Joe, someone who is better than Melvin Gordon has a better role than Melvin Gordon uh, is coming off injury, but projects to be healthy by week one. If week one goes off in week one, when we expect it's Chris Carson, who people just hate, I guess. Well, they worry about, and they have good reason because this is a guy that did fumble a lot last year. And we all know if there was a healthy alternative, there's a good chance he would have lost that job, but there really wasn't. So Chris Carson was very steady. I think the problem is what's your trust level uh, when you're talking about Pete Carroll and what's your trust level of him trusting Chris Carson with the football. It would all look as though Chris Carson, who was very steady last year, uh, even though he did have the fumble problems, a uh, very steady role in the offense. I think you could definitely put him ahead of Melvin Gordon, and I wouldn't even bat an eye about it. It's all about the health. I think this is one that will change and flip-flop as we get closer and you start to see Carson on the field. So here's the thing about Chris Carson. So he's the guy. 
He has these fumbling problems. He's always recovered from the fumbling problems. Maybe fumbling problems don't go away. Maybe that just never happens, and that's the risk. But that risk is baked in with this current ADP in the low 20s, running back number 14 off the board. You know he's going to be involved in the passing game, and you know Rashad Penny's just not going to do anything. And he's not even – like, you think that Carson's hurt. Penny's even more hurt. Then you look at their draft. Who do they draft? DJ Dallas? Wicka, wicka. No, he's not going to be any good. Chris Carson <laughs> – is likely who you – he's just not sexy. I mean, we get him in fantasy on our team every single year because no one fucking wants this guy. Every year, you're, you're damn right. Every year we end up with Chris Carson, and I'm going to have shares of him again because he's going to fall down draft boards because of the fumbling and some injury issues, and people want to make an excuse for Penny, but Penny tore his ACL out last year, what, week 14? He, he may not be ready to start the year. And if DJ Dallas, he's just going to cut into what Penny does. So for me, Carson is safe. I talked about backs over the past couple of years, only nine of them with 2,000 rushing yards, at least 2,000 rushing yards over the last few years. He's one of them, 315 touches. That was the sixth most last year, even with those fumbling issues. Yeah, there were some concerns. I'll admit, yeah, Pat, you and I were texting. We were sweating it out like, holy shit, is Carson going to lose his job? Is he going to fumble again? If he fumbles one more time, he's done. But he overcame those fumbles even down the stretch when he had them again pop up in competitive games against the Eagles against the 49ers, the Vikings. I think he fumbled three games in a row. They still bounced back against uh, the Rams, touched the ball 20-plus times. So he's safe. He's going to get those goal line touches. And also Seattle, they want to run the football. This is something that they've done now over the past couple of years. They run the rock. People want to, want Wilson to run, want him to throw more. It's just, it's just not the way it is in Seattle. And Pete Carroll is – Say what you want about coaches around the league. And Carroll's, he's been pretty honest. He says, yeah, Carson's fumbling. I don't want him to fumble, but we're going back to him. And every single time they go back to him. So I, I have no issues. Carson's not going to be a guy that you have to draft as a top 12, 13 running back. He's going to fall past 15. So I think he's one of the better values out there. I think he's got one more solid year in him. So running back number 15 currently on PPR draft boards, Joe, Miles Sanders. And we've played this Doug Peterson game before where you know, outside of Darren Sproles and Ryan Matthews, uh, very rarely is he willing to commit to anyone, even in a single game, to get the majority of touches. A plurality, sure. We're not playing the plurality game. We're not living in a parliamentary system here where first past the post is what you want. This is a presidential system when we're talking about running backs. You want the majority of the shares in the backfield. And Sanders does look like he's going to get that. It's really only Boston Scott who is going to take those away from him right now. But how much do you trust that this isn't a 55-45 split and every third week, oh, all of a sudden Boston Scott has 17 carries and Sanders isn't being used. I don't think that's going to happen, but it could. I don't think that's going to happen either, just watching the two of those guys play last year. Miles Sanders was markedly better than Scott. Uh, and Miles Sanders was a guy, actually, I, I acquired at almost every trading deadline because a lot of people kind of given up. I always feel like rookie running backs are always more interesting as the season goes on than they are in the first six weeks. And people lose their patience, basically. The Devin Singletary's of the world who, you know, start off hot and then get hurt. And, you know, Miles Sanders who kind of started slow and had to inch his way in there. I always look at rookie running backs for the most part and say, I want all the shares of them in the second half of the season more than drafting them. And that's how I felt about Sanders. And I am somebody who every single year says, don't draft anybody from Philadelphia because it's going to be a complete mess. And then here I am acquiring Miles Sanders because there was there was no risk anymore. It was all just upside. Now, there's risk here coming into this year without a doubt. But if you look at the last like seven weeks or so for Miles Sanders, they were very productive. It does seem like he's carved out that role. And I think although Doug Peterson will be frustrating at times, I would be very surprised if it gets anywhere close to a timeshare scenario. So every team has that moment where that other guy is going to vulture a touchdown. That just happens. I think Miles Sanders is the guy going forward, and I think he's going to be the first guy in this regime to get a legitimate shot at being the, quote, man. So for me, Meany, I actually like Sanders more than I like Carson, just because of that potential upside it brings. Like, Carson, to me, although he's not safe for all the reasons that we laid out, he is kind of safe based on where you have to draft him and what you get from him. He's... Like, when you go look at his per-game averages, he's, like, the 13th best running back. If he plays, he's good. If he doesn't play, turns out, spoiler, not good. But Sanders has the potential that if the job is, they're just like, here you go, son, the keys are yours now. All of a sudden, he could be a top-five guy. 
Yeah, absolutely. He can. I mean, he finished as uh, RB1, borderline RB1 last year with, you know, look at the first few games. I mean, 11 carries, 10, 13, 9, 3, 6, 3. He was playing behind Jordan Howard. He just was. And when Jordan Howard was in the lineup, when he was hurt over the last eight games of the season, Miles Sanders touched on average 19 times. That was his touches. So he was a guy that, yeah, th- I see it firsthand with Doug Peterson. I mean, you alluded to it. I mean, there's only a handful of times, I think five maybe before this season, where he gave a running back the ball 20 times. And Ryan Matthews had four of those times. That was his rookie season coaching with the Eagles. The Super Bowl run, they had Ajayi and Sproles and Clement and Blunt. They had all of those options. There's no real threat. Doug Peterson hasn't had a back like this that can do everything run between the tackles and catch. And I was talking earlier about elite company with four running backs. We've had at least 700 rushing yards, 500 receiving yards, 50 catches and 4.5 yards per carry last year. CMC, Kamara, Dalvin cook and oh. miles Sanders. Wow. Sanders is in that company as well. He caught a lot of balls towards the end of last year. Now, Was some of that because Deshaun Jackson and Alshon Jeffrey, they're rolling guys out off the street? Sure, part of that was. But the fact that he was still able, he had six games in a row where he caught the ball at least three times and showing that explosiveness out of the backfield, 50 yards, 77 yards. Those are receiving yard numbers on top of 100 yards on the ground, 80 yards on the ground. So I think that you can kind of throw out what Doug Peterson has done in the past. And they've invested in Miles Sanders. They didn't draft anyone. You guys mentioned Boston Scott as a Darren Sproles type guy who maybe will be frustrating at times and catch a few balls out of the backfield. But I think that Miles Sanders, I think he he's going to have the keys of the offense. I think he's going to be a big player in the game, and I love where he's going in drafts. I agree with you, Pat. I like him more than Carson as well because of what he does through the air. Carson's not catching 50 balls. There's no chance. Three for three. I'm with you guys. Miles Sanders over Carson also. So, so there you go. Currently being drafted as number 16 running back from the New York Jumbo Jets, Le'Veon Bell. <laughs> it's a situation where things can only improve. Maybe he doesn't go like bowling <laughs> for a game this year. Yeah. But like they bring in Frank Gore to back him up. Like that's not really concerning to me. Just oh, Joe, you're local to the area. What do you see from Le'Veon Bell? <laughs> I'm local, but far from a Jet fan. Thank God. Oh God. It's uh, I see Adam Gase. That's what I see, and I see nightmares. This is not a good roster. You want to look at some rosters that are bad. This there's one for you. The Jets roster is bad i'm sorry i mean they, they have nobody to throw the ball to and then mims is there now but i mean that's a lot to ask a rookie to come in and be the number one with a quarterback that still has a lot of development left to do uh you know you just made the comment of well this is the best uh the last time you know doug peterson actually has a weapon and this good and it's his opportunity to use it and that was the exact same logic a lot of people were applying last year with adam gase and the jets well yeah i know he screwed up a lot of running backs in the past like lamar miller and Kenyon drake and all these other guys but he's never had levy on bell before well he had levy on bell last year and it was an absolute train wreck i mean it was so awful compared to his standards and the jets offense is not the steelers offense so i don't know where we go from here uh i can tell you right now i'm okay being wrong about this i will have probably zero levy on bell shares zero i can't imagine me going after him at all I don't like this team. I don't like the offense. I don't like Adam Gase. Frank Gore being there is annoying because I feel like he's going to show up and then take away a touchdown. Clevion Bell even did have a good game. So I am out and I am perfectly content to see him do well on someone else's team in my league. I'm at peace with that. Uh, he's a really interesting player that coming into the season, Meanie, because you can project all of like the high end Le'Veon Bell numbers onto him. Like you just look at his attempts, you know, double digits every game except for one. He ends the season 16, 25, 21 carries on the ground, five catches, four catches. You're looking at the target numbers. They look pretty good. That what am I missing with him? Like we talk, like everyone's like just lining up to say Leonard Fournette, Elvin Kamara, touchdown, positive regression coming. Four touchdowns for Le'Veon Bell last year on, what is this, over 300 touches? He seems like someone who should score more this year. Yeah, he he does seem like someone he should score more. And when you're talking about um, earlier, like it can't be worse. And I I kind of agree that it can't be worse because 3.2 yards per carry is... (laughs) I mean, that's, that's pretty bad. I mean, those, those type of backs who turn out 3.2 yards per carry on 245 carries don't play the following year or lose their <laughs> job, right? So, I mean, you look at years past, obviously playing in the Steelers offense was a little bit different. I mean, you have a capable quarterback and weapons that can open up the backfield, but 
even as bad as it was, he finished his RB 16 in a full point setting. He had touched the ball 311 times, top 10 in the league. And let's be honest. I mean, he dealt with pretty poor quarterback time at yeah, who was, who was backing up Darnold when he had mono. Was it Luke Falk? Yeah. Like there was, there was times where he was just running into walls and that may happen again, losing Robbie Anderson, the deep threat. I agree. It's probably going to take some time for Mims to, um, you know, be a player in that offense. But I think Sam Darnold being under center last year for the entire year may have helped him. Uh, it would have helped him a little bit, at least some of those games where he just had 18 carries for like 18 yards. It just, you know, there was really no help for him. So I don't know how many shares I'll have of Lev Bell either, but I, I feel like if he's going to get drafted outside the top 20 backs, and I think that's a real possibility. Again, I'll go back to the athletic mock. I took him, I took him in the fifth round. And what? I took him as RB3. Oh, yeah. you took him, he got him in the fifth round of a, of a yeah. draft? Yeah, wow. as, as somebody who's just nobody wants a piece of, right? So, again, we go back to these backs like Bell or Aaron Jones, and people are just like, nah, like they make an excuse for, oh, he can't repeat that. Or in this case, Bell's recency bias, what he, you know, remember, he took a full year off. Right. He didn't play for was it an last year. year. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. But he didn't play for an entire year. And, and there was, a, you know, a little bit of a slow start from him. So, I, again, it depends on where he goes. I, I don't want to draft him in, at this point as what are we at now? RB 15 roughly. So, yeah. Running back 16 overall. That where was... the hell's Kenyon Drake? Am I am I like high or, or did we miss him yet? Like, where is he? Two players whose ADPs really haven't been accounted for yet, which is kind of strange because Kenyon Drake has been out there for a while. His actual ADP right now that I'm looking at it. Uh, comes in in like the 50s. That's just simply not where he's going to go. Uh, he might go the back end of the second round, probably middle of the third round. Now that he is the guy, he's signed his extension, or at least his one-year tender with the Arizona Cardinals. And honestly, Manny, look at what he did last year. Like, why shouldn't he be even higher? Like, why am I debating? And I, I know that we kind of keep harping on certain guys, but like Mixon, Jacobs, all these guys, Chubb. Why isn't Kenyon Drake in that mix? Yeah, I don't know. He he definitely should be. He's somebody that, honestly, I'll definitely think about in the second round and, and maybe even the end of the first, depending on how the how the backs go off the board. And when you're talking about those other guys, I mean, one thing you can say about Drake that you can't say about Chubb with confidence is, is the catches. Yeah, 103 catches over the last two seasons with Drake, and we know we, we wanted him to be freed from Miami for, for years eight games with Arizona, 28 grabs. It's 56 over a full season. If you just look at those eight games too, at least three catches in six of the eight. So is he going to touch the ball 300 times? There's still Chase Edmonds on that roster. Um, you know, Benjamin's a guy that fell to the seventh round of the draft. I don't think he's a real threat. He looked really good at times. There were a couple, you know, dud games from him, you know, like Aaron Jones, but there were a lot of just positive games where he was a big player in that offense. It's an exciting fast tempo offense. Drake, to me, is a, is a borderline RB1. I think he's a top 12 back with a lot of upside in that offense. Yeah, trying to make sense of, like, the jigsaw puzzle, Joe, that are all, like, the running backs, that I could see Drake coming in inside my top 10. Like, this is such a great mm -hmm. situation for a running back to be in. In this offense, which is constantly going to be running verts down the field, it's going to be high tempo, that running's kind of easy in this offense. Like, you don't need the best offensive line in the world because so much has to be accounted for in the passing game that there are running lanes. Like, you're not going to face a whole lot of stacked boxes. And if you're going to be the running back who's on the field over 70% of the time, that's really going to benefit you. And I think year one to year two with Kingsbury, we're not going to see a whole bunch of field goals from the one-yard line anymore. I think that's going to be... <laughs> <laughs> that was a year one thing. Year two, we're going to evolve into going forward a little bit more. No, I, I absolutely agree. Everything you just said is exactly right about the offense. And I've taken a lot of shots over the years for being a big Kenyon Drake supporter. And it hasn't worked out for me in many of those years. But finally, last year, it did. Mostly, I want to blame Adam Gase for that, not myself. So I'm just going to push the blame somewhere else and blame him because we saw it with Lamar Miller, right? There was a guy that uh, was a good back. And then eventually, you know, he, he couldn't get to where he wanted to be or where we wanted him to be as a fantasy community until they got out of Miami. And then he became a very solid, one of the more solid RB twos that you'll ever find boring, but solid Kenyon Drake, super talented, never got the touches, never got the opportunity. And finally he moves on to Arizona last year. And after week nine, he was one of the top five fantasy running backs. 
Now, granted, he did have a couple dud games, but you talk about Chase Edmonds. Let's talk about when Chase Edmonds was actually healthy, how good he was in that offense. David Johnson was never healthy last year. He looked like someone shot him in the back and he could barely move around. So a healthy Kenyon Drake in an offense that now Andrew <laughs> DeAndre Hopkins this offseason still has a couple other wide receivers. Oh, wait, one who's going into the Hall of Fame named Larry Fitzgerald, a young mobile quarterback in an offense that is going to run a ton of plays. How do you not love Kenyon Drake? He's a very athletic, uh, dynamic back, a guy who can catch the ball in the backfield, a guy who really just doesn't have nearly the tread on the tires as a lot of other backs at that same age in the NFL. To me, in the Black Book, he is already uh, a very strong second-round running back. I don't know why anyone wouldn't consider him in the second round. We talked about some of these other guys, too, who have lots of you know shady, shadowy kind of situations around them. I don't see Chase Edmonds taking away a lot from Kenyon Drake. Kenyon Drake proved himself last year, especially in those 49er games, those in-division games. When you step up and have big games against rival opponents in your division, I think that goes a very long way with your teammates and with your coaching staff. I think Kenyon Drake has really solidified himself in 2020 as the guy in Arizona. So when it comes to winning fantasy football, like you're going to have to roll the dice. Obviously every pick is a gamble. It's a roll of the dice. No one's guaranteed to stay healthy, but Kenyon Drake based on where he's going right now, whether it's, it's probably going to be in the middle of the third round to be perfectly honest with you. Or if a lot of buzz creeps up, like me, he said end of the second and then pushed up into that territory a little bit, kind of where Miles Sanders is going. Mm -hmm. uh, so ahead of Chris Carson, but after that sort of tier that we broke down of the seven running backs, maybe he'll end up breaching that if enough buzz goes into it. But he seems like a home run pick that it was a lot like Dalvin Cook last year, Todd Gurley a few years ago, where these guys are just, you know, end of the second, early third, but have the potential based on the volume, based on the offense to really breach into that top level that if you get it right, you probably win your league. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And I think you also realize that, uh, it's part of why you don't want to do too crazy in your first round pick, right? I mean, it's why Ezekiel Elliott's a nice safe round pick. It's why uh, if you're looking at guys like, you know, Michael Thomas, guys like uh, DeAndre Hopkins, Julio Jones, those are very safe picks as opposed to Alvin Kamara, which I don't think is a safe pick. I understand the upside there too, but when you can solidify somebody as your star, your guy in the offense, let's say you take Hopkins in the middle of the first round, right? In a PPR and then in the, in the second or third round, a guy like Kenyon Drake is available, a home run kind of guy running back. Why wouldn't you take him? Then you can always solidify it with somebody a little bit more boring, uh, like a Mark Ingram later on, yeah. too. And, and well, I know, ugh, but you know what? They run the ball a ton. Yeah. So somebody like that. Okay. Where why, you're why, going why, to... why wouldn't you just draft someone good, not someone who sucks? <laughs> well, look. All you right, literally well, could about... have said anybody else, Joe, besides I Mark know. Man. I know. He hate... Well, you know what? But, you know, I'm just talking about somebody that you know exactly who he is. And I think. You can, you can put another name in there to not upset Pat, which I think is perfectly fine. We don't want to upset him, especially at this hour. Uh, <laughs> so I think what you do is you, you find ways to do it, but you build in the first round with guys that you know are going to be what they are, which is first-round talents. Whereas Alvin Kamara, maybe he is, maybe he isn't, but I know Hopkins is, I know Julio Jones is, and I know Ezekiel Elliott is. I mean, I don't even know about Hopkins in this new situation. I know that he's awesome, but... Like we were talking briefly in part one about the top end receivers that like I would much prefer go Adams over DeAndre Hopkins. At least I know the situation with Adams. I know what his market share is going to be. It strikes me as the only two players I really want to own on Arizona this year are going to be Drake and Murray. No, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll take Hopkins too. I think uh, awesome. You could stop there in the evaluation. I mean, when you watch it, I mean, look, let's not forget how good DeAndre Hopkins was playing with Brian Hoyer. Let's not forget that he played with Brock Osweiler. Let's not forget, like, this guy was pretty much amazeballs even before he got Deshaun Watson. So we kind of forget that. And Kyler Murray's pretty good. So I understand, like, we're not exactly sure. But I think every now and then you'll take a leap of faith with somebody who's an all-world talent. And I think Hopkins is. Sure, but I'm not... I'm not saying doing anything to discredit DeAndre Hopkins in terms of talent. It's just this new situation in Arizona where they're going to be playing a lot, a lot of four wide receiver sets that, you know, Christian Kirk's going to get downfield. Larry Fitz is still going to be there that I just don't think that the overall share and volume for DeAndre Hopkins is going to be there on the level of Thomas or of Adams or even of Julio. Cause Julio, there's a ton of mouths to feed in Atlanta as well, but at least we've established a baseline underneath this offense of what he's going to do. That's the reason that i would push hopkins like four or five at receiver and i wouldn't consider him like a super safe pick at number five on returning that value would he put up second round value probably but that's not what i want out of my number five overall pick 
Yeah, well, yeah. look, I can understand that too, right, Meany? I mean, when you yeah. think about, it, I mean, Adams is probably the safer one because you do know what it is. But at the same time, do you want the young uh, quarterback who looks really fresh and running around, or you want Aaron Rodgers, who seems like a quarterback who, again, it's those three hundred yard big games are not part of what this offense is, and not what Aaron Rodgers is right now, right, Chris? Yeah, f- for sure. I-, I think it's fair though to have some concern, Pat, on you know a new situation and a new offense is still a young quarterback, it's still some struggles with the offensive line and a lot of weapons that you alluded to. I mean, you'll look at DeAndre Hopkins. This guy's not going to get 192 targets that he uh, that he had in 2015 or 174 that he had in 2017. I think what he got last year, but 150 I- is fair. Is he going to get a thousand yards? He probably will for sure. But th- I think there'll be some some inconsistent games from Hopkins that we haven't seen before in the past because Watson's a guy that really just fed the ball to DeAndre Hopkins numerous times. There were a lot of games where he was just the one, right? When Will Fuller went down, who was the other option? Mm-hmm. There was really just nobody in that offense. So I agree. Adams is my two, but um, yeah, Hopkins is still a stud and he's, he'll probably still get his. And Julio, you can make a case for him too, that he'll probably end up with more targets and catches, but the, the higher ceiling, I believe, is still with Hopkins. All right, so let's move on from Drake, the other guy who's throwing a wrench into ADPs because it really hasn't been accounted for yet and where he's going to settle because there's a lot of differing opinions on both Damian Williams and the rookie drafted in the first round, 32nd overall in the NFL draft, Clyde's Edward Hilaire. Yes, I suppose. We'll see where this ADP ends up. I've seen him go as high as the first round. Uh, I've seen him go as low as the sixth round. Meaning, like, what's a realistic take? Because some people think they spent this draft capital on him. He is now the guy. And if you have the guy in the Chiefs offense in the backfield and they use him at a 70, 75% clip, that guy probably is a first round pick. Yeah, he, you're right. He probably is. I mean, Andy Reid has been able to utilize any running back that he's thrown in there going back to his days in Philadelphia. And then you hear him talk up Clyde Edwards Hilaire a lot like Brian Westbrook. And, it's, it's, you know, you kind of have to take a step back here just a little bit. Any back in that offense, to your point, Mahomes is probably going to, you know, be a borderline RB1. I, I'm not going to draft him in the first. I know our buddy that we mentioned here, Jake Seeley on the show, it, is really high on him. I, at the athletic mock, he took him, I think, sixth overall. That's just too much risk for me. He has to basically be perfect to, to return that kind of value. I don't think he's going to be a guy that touches the ball 250 times, to be honest with you. I still think Damian Williams is going to be involved. I have some question marks about the offensive line. I don't think that they're going to throw the ball all that often. I don't know if he's going to be the goal line back there, but he can be a guy like Austin Eckler last year, a guy like Alvin Kamara two years ago, where he just touches the ball 12 to 15 times in that offense. And he does enough to return value three or four catches out of the backfield explosiveness. He is a really, really talented running back, but I won't be drafting him in the first round. Joe, how about the second round? Because we talk about home run picks. This could be the home run pick, but it could also be a complete whiff if Damian Williams is the starter. Yeah, I think second round is even too high for me. And, uh, you know, for perspective, I know Jake was very high on Damian Williams last year, and he and I had lots of arguments about that. Uh, Damian Williams was the number one bust running back in the Black Book last year, and uh, he pretty much busted for the most part. Look, Andy Reid's been trying to find the next Kareem Hunt ever since Kareem Hunt was gone. And I think Alaire is going to be the closest thing he gets. When I watched Alaire, I used to, uh, on Saturday afternoons, I used to turn to my cousin who I watched the games with and say, and this guy actually reminds me a little of Brian Westbrook. And then he ends up with Andy Reid. <laughs> and I could not have been more excited for Like, I thought this was amazing. And as somebody who is super excited about Alaire, at the same time, I think you have to be realistic. And at the same time, you look at it and you say, okay, the month of September, they're probably going to be in a bit of a timeshare. They're going to give Alaire an opportunity to run away with it. I have no doubt about that. And I think Alaire could end up becoming a first round value, but I don't think that journey is going to start for him until we go into October this year. And again, we have one extra game on the schedule. There's a little bit more time here to get rookies acclimated to what's going on. I have no doubt Alaire is going to be the better running back in that system, but it's whether or not those first four or five weeks of the season, when you're playing regular season games in your fantasy league, how productive can he be and how much can he give you? And that's why I'm looking at more of a third round grade on him in terms of if you want to be aggressive on him, I think third round is your second or maybe even third running back. If you went three running backs in a row, that could be a terrific payoff. You want the running back in the chief system. Mm-hmm. There hasn't been the guy since Kareem Hunt. 
I think this is the closest we're going to get to that. I love this guy in college too. This is a guy that breaks tackles, goes the extra distance. He's a tough running back. I don't care what he graded out of the combine. I don't give a crap about that. All I care about is what he did on the field. And we watched him on the field. He was a game changing momentum, stealing running back from the other team. He was a backbreaking kind of running back because he was always willing to go that extra mile and fight for a little bit more. And that takes its toll on opposing defenses. So if you are sitting with the second pick of the third round and all of these guys are on the board, would you take Edwards, Hilaire or Miles Sanders? Uh, I think I would still take Miles Sanders because I was so impressed by how he finished last year. And I think he actually has even more clarity in his situation than Hilaire does. I don't think Damian Williams is good enough. The question is, how long does it take Hilaire to get acclimated? And how much does Andy Reid want to push him early in the season? Because I think we all know the Chiefs have their sets, uh, their sights set on January. Uh, that's what they're playing for. They're playing for playoffs. They're not worried so much about winning games in the regular season. They want this guy to be right. They want him to be healthy. And they want to manage him a little bit as they get through the very long season into the playoffs. So give me... Uh, Miles Sanders, because I think the Eagles are going to be in a dogfight in that division again. Meany? Uh, I, I I have these guys side by side, and I have Clyde Edwards Hilaire one spot ahead of Miles Sanders. It's a great uh, comparison of, that you brought up the two. And Joe's talking about into October and November. There could be a buy low opportunity for a guy like Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Mm. I don't know if anybody, per, you know, if they have that investment where they draft him in the end of the first, early second, maybe they just hang on to him all year. But a guy like Miles Sanders, a guy like Devin Singletary, these are two backs that started off slow to, to Joe's point. I mean, learning the offense, dealing with other backs in the system. And then all of a sudden you get to halfway through the season and they are borderline bell cow backs. I mean, Singletary is going to have some issues this year with Zach Moss, but he was somebody in the end last few games of the season had a lot of touches. Miles Sanders, we talked about the same thing. So it could take a couple weeks for Clyde Edwards Hilaire, but I think I would just take that upside of the back in the Chiefs offense, knowing how good that they're going to be every single week and not dealing with Doug Peterson, as we talked about, just the question in the back of your head, uh, what's going to happen there. All right, Meany, we'll stick with you then. So Clyde Edwards Hilaire or Kenyon Drake? Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Joe? Uh, Kenyon Drake. Sorry. I mean, I love Hilaire. Uh, and maybe, you know, we're talking it, you know what? It, 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 it doesn't sound like you love Edwards Hilaire. I do, but I'm, I think, but here's the thing. We always get very enamored with the shiny new toy. Right. And I think that's the problem is I'm, I am super excited. The first, as soon as it happened, I was texting Adam Ronas, who, who was working with me on the black book. And I said, okay, am I crazy to be as excited as I am about Hilaire? And he's like, nope, I'm just as excited as you. And I said, okay. Cause I know if that's a guy who I respect the utmost, who I compete in all these leagues. And I think he is the gold standard in terms of these expert leagues that I've been in over the years and actually getting to beat him last year in flex was my crowning achievement in life, I feel like, oh, uh, which no. is sad oh, for my no. life. But no, but here's the thing. <laughs> Didn't you like work on I... Game of Thrones? <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is this. The idea is we have to look, you talk about Miles Sanders. Right? You could be excited about him last year. How long did it take him to be good? Devin Singletary, excited about him last year. How long did it take him to be good? It takes a while for rookies to figure out pass protections. It takes a while for rookie running backs to gain confidence of the coaching staff. And I agree. Yeah, they they went out there and got their guy and it's a first round and everyone should be super excited. But it doesn't mean that you throw away all the good work, the guys who have been in the league a couple of years and established themselves already. Kenyon Drake is right on that bubble for me, too. I will take Drake. I will take Miles Sanders. I will take the proven entities. I know Alaire could be the absolute home run. You're not wrong about that. But there's also a risk. And early on, I don't know how much risk I want to take making that guy my RB1. And I just don't think that's necessary. So to me, we talked about that tier of seven that has the Mixons, the Fournettes, the Chubbs, the Derrick Henrys. I don't think that Edwards, Hilaire, Sanders, or Drake are that far behind that tier or just throw them into that tier because I actually prefer them to some of the people as a part of that back end of the quote-unquote top 10 by ADP. But some of the other people that we've talked about in the show, Bell, Carson, Melvin Gordon, I think those guys are behind that group. Absolutely. I would definitely think so. I mean, I, I would take Hilaire over Le'Veon Bell in a second. <laughs> that, that is that is not difficult for me at all. Carson, you could start to have that conversation too. And and, and again, I want to just it's not a knock on Hilaire. It's just the normal rookie pattern. And I think when you're looking at running backs in the last five or ten years who were 
slam dunk right away. Fantastic. It was the transcendent back. It was Saquon Barkley. It was Ezekiel Elliott. It was guys that we knew were going to be first round greats. And I, I had Saquon Barkley in the black book a couple of years ago in his rookie season, top five. You can't imagine how much crap we took for that because people say, like, how could you put him in the top five? I'm like, look, this is just the situation. This is how good he is. This is how good the situation is for him. He is going to be that offense. And he was with a he might not be that offense. You got to realize too, there's Tyreek Hill, there's Travis Kelsey. Uh, not that Watkins is any good. There's other guys out there. And Andy Reid does have a history of being able to be versatile with the backs, at least when he wants to be. I think Alaire will be a better second half player than a first half player. And Meany's 100% right when he talks about a trade target. If you can get somebody in your league that overpays for Hilaire and he's looking like he's a bust on October 15th, you go in there, you pounce and you get him on the cheap and you ride the wave just like you did with Devin Singletary or Miles Sanders or all those guys in the second half of last year. I, I think that's easier said than done, though, because in real like it, that's great on paper to say, yes, if he's a quote unquote bust. I mean, if there's one thing where he's not getting any carries whatsoever and that like he's just truly horrible, then maybe you're right. But let's just say he's kind of middling a lot like Sanders was last year that are you a really going to go in and hugely overpay to acquire this talent based on nothing that you've seen so far in the hopes that it ends up turning around? Maybe, but meaning most times that this happens in like real fantasy football leagues is the guy that ends up with Edwards Hilaire didn't take him in the middle of the third round. He took him probably at the beginning of the second round because there's going to be one guy in your league who does that or in an auction, they're going to wildly overpay that even if the guy sucks after six weeks, they're still going to want the value. Not because that's right. That's because how people are. Yeah, you're dead on. That's exactly how people are. In an auction, too, I, I see him as a as a back that you're just going to be two or three people in your league that want a piece of this offense. It's the exact reason that everyone was so excited about Damian Williams last year. And Joe's right. He was an absolute bust. And he I, just wanted to be. He was. He, he was, was. But he, I mean, was, he, ended he was up, an absolute bust. He got hurt. In the games where he wasn't yeah. hurt, he was really good. <laughs> But that was part of it. That was part of why he was I, going to be I a bust guess. because he's a back so, that never but, touched but, the but, ball. But, like, but, same but, thing but, with Connor. You could put Connor into that conversation too. Guys who you're worried about health, you know, and, and it matters in the NFL. It does matter. It matters how high you want to take those guys. It's not if you want to take them. It's what risk you're willing to take them at. But the point with Damien is, yeah, he was a bust be- and he got hurt. Sure. If we give him a pass, okay. But he was also a back that before he head into last season had never had more than 50 carries in a year. And that was the question. Could he handle a full workload? And at times when he played, yeah, there was some games, obviously, in the Super Bowl. It doesn't count for fantasy, but you see his potential when he touches the ball 15 times, what he can do for you. And this is the same thing with Clyde Edwards Hilaire. But at the same time as well, when you're looking at this Chiefs offense and you're talking about all the options that they have for Patrick Mahomes, 375 times they ran as a team. It's that that ranked 27th in all of football. They just don't run the football all that much, and they don't have that great of an offensive line. So that's my point with Clyde Edwards Hilaire is, yeah, there's going to be two or three people in your league that really want a piece of that back because he's in that offense. But don't be surprised if there's games where he touches the ball like 10 or 11 times and a first round back to touch the ball 10 or, 10 or 11 times, it's it's not worth it to me. And in auctions, there's going to be one or two people in your league that are really driving up that price. So you're right, Pat. It doesn't always work out that way where you can just buy in and, and acquire a back like that in the first four weeks because of the investment that other people in your leagues have made. But, man, you're really going to have to. I think I don't think there's a way that he's going to be there in the third. I think this is a back that's going to be gone definitely in the first couple picks of the second. Just- I think you make a great point there about the uh, – Meany made a great point about uh, auctions too with Hilaire. That's going to be a make-or-break player because there's going to be a high price tag on him. And if he does not succeed, especially out of the gate – that could be a real albatross around a lot of rosters early on. Just looking at how early drafts are breaking, that if you do isolate the top three guys, and I think we all kind of agree that McCaffrey, Barkley, and Elliott are probably one, two, three. We all seem to be a bit lower on Kamara than everyone else. He's more like the rest of the pack than he is like those three guys we mentioned. Now, upside-wise, of course, he could be the number one player. Probably not going to happen. Everything would have to go right. That I think that realistically baseline, Drake, Sanders, Edwards, Hilaire are kind of all in that Camara camp where things could go really right, things could go really wrong, but it's probably just somewhere in between that he's closer to those guys potentially than even the top three, even though the Saints offense is just tremendous, but so was the Chiefs offense. That if you didn't get one of the three picks, like I'm thinking about how I'm going to construct my rankings, that Thomas Adams for sure 
would be pick number four or pick number five for me, just based on how I can construct the rest of my roster. Like if I right. went rounds two, three, four and ended up with Sanders, Drake, Carson, Edwards, Hilaire, like one of these guys, Delvin Cook, who we talked about, who continues to slip, Todd Gurley, who we'll get to in the next show, is going like the fifth round, something like that. Like you could pile up three or four really good running backs and get that stud. You could even go Devontae Adams, Travis Kelsey and end up with three good running backs running back is weirdly deep this year uh, as opposed to most other years which I did not expect coming into this conversation it, it is I, I think you're right Pat I mean when you're looking at it too it's uh, you could very easily get a structure also where you take uh, like you said Devontae Adams and then you double up with Kenyon Drake and Miles Sanders or uh, Edwards Hilaire and Chris Carson or something like that. So uh, I think you're also mitigating a lot of risk when you take a wide receiver and a PPR in the first round, because what you're doing is you're taking a little bit more of the injury quotient out of there. Not that wide receivers never get hurt. Of course, everybody gets hurt. It's football, but it's a little less wear and tear than the running backs, a little lower uh, quotient in terms of injury factor when you're talking about these guys. And I think that's a really wise strategy because if you don't have a slam dunk guy, as your RB1 in the first round, why not take <laughs> Julio Jones? Why not take the established guy, the guy that you know you can put in ink every single week on your roster, what he's going to give you, and then you can take a lot of chances. And maybe you're going to take some chances as we go on, too, with some of these other running backs who might emerge as the guy as time goes on. Or maybe you could take a lot of these other guys, like, you know, say, well, if you really don't believe in Melvin Gordon and his ability to stay healthy, maybe later you do kind of pluck a Philip Lindsay. There's a lot of guys you can pluck off who are like 1A running backs on their team, not timeshare guys, but guys that you know they could step in right away and be that guy, that's a rarity. Usually the handcuff we talked about is a big giant drop-off from the first guy. It's less so this year than any year that I remember in recent history. All right, that will do it. Part two, running back, average draft position, player-by-player player profiles. If you want to check out part one, hit the description of this video, podcast. I want to thank Joe. I want to thank Chris Meany. And we'll be back for part three. So, Continue to check out this series and spread around the word. Smash the like and do everything else like that. I'm Pat Mayo. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. Experience. Experience.